All right, folks. How are we doing? Good morning. Welcome, welcome to our Air Miners Life Cycle Analysis Techno Economic Analysis event. With much fanfare and ballyhoo, we are here. Um, my name is Jason Grillo, the event director for Air Miners. Hope that got your energy going this morning. Um, we are joined by esteemed company from the Global CO2 Initiative at the University of Michigan. Full disclosure, I'm not an alum, but I uh, wanted to uh, roll out the welcome mat to Volker Sick, Christoph Mangan, and Grant Faber for an excellent event describing how organizations can think about, use life cycle analysis and techno-economic analysis for their, uh, for their uh, achieving their goals. So that in mind, we've got a great event ahead of us today. Um, we will, uh, get started shortly. Uh, Tito, could you share the link to the Global CO2 Initiative? Thank you. Uh, so a little bit about the content. This is, again, not going to be a nuts and bolts detail of how to run a, uh, how, how to uh, calculate various uh, outcomes for life cycle analysis and techno-economic analysis. You know, we're not going to get into equations and, quanti and quantitative studies in, uh, in deep detail, rather to think of an overview of what it will look like. For those uh, deep dive types of insights, I defer to what resources you can see on the Global CO2 Initiative site. Um, with that, again, welcome everyone. And uh, welcome to, uh, again, Volker, Christoph, and Grant. I will kick it off to Grant, who hails from the University of Michigan. Um, Grant, take it away. Yes, thank you, Jason, and thank you for that. Uh, th thank you for that introduction. Um, so everyone, thank you very much for coming today. Uh, my name is Grant Faber. I am a master's student in sustainable and complex systems, and I also work as a research assistant at the Global CO2 Initiative, and I've been doing that for some time now, uh, and I'll be moderating the event today. So I'll be asking Volker and Christoph some questions and, and going back and forth. Uh, so I'll start, uh, we're, so we're going to start with Volker, we'll start with um, asking him some, some questions and allowing him to share some slides, but first I'll, I'll give him an introduction. So he is the Arthur F. Thurnau Professor of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Michigan. Uh, he is the DT Energy Professor of Advanced Energy Research here, and he's the former Associate Vice President um, of uh, Research for Natural Sciences and Engineering. Uh, and then currently he works as the, as the director of the Global CO2 Initiative, so as my and, and Christoph's supervisor, uh, and he's also a review editor for Frontiers in Climate, the Negative Emissions Journal. So clearly he's a very prolific scholar, um, and his vision, uh, you know, I've seen this from working with him, his vision for carbon removal in the field and where it's headed is, is really unrivaled, and so it's really a pleasure to work with him, and, uh, and, and it's been great, and, and I think we're all very lucky to, to be able to uh, hear from him today. So... Uh, with that, uh, Volker, I'll hand it over to you because I know you have a few slides to share just to give some background about the Global CO2 Initiative and the, and the things we work on, uh, just to kind of set the stage and give some context for today's event. So and then after that, we can get into uh, some more questions and discussion. So uh, yeah, go ahead. Certainly. Certainly. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Grant. I mean, this, I'm, I'm not sure I can live up to the uh, expectation that you've created uh, with this introduction. Um, but uh, let me let me try. Um, I'm, I'm certainly uh, grateful uh, to uh, Air Miners for putting this event together, and I, I hope that with this brief introduction into why we put so much effort into this assessment, um, it's uh, it becomes a, a, bit, a bit more apparent. Um, I will cover some of uh, some of what um, we want to convey today, and Christoph later will will provide a little more. Uh, technical depth uh, to one aspect that we currently focus on. But I think it's somewhat important to understand um, uh, the Global CO2 Initiative, um, our, our vision and, and how we see ourselves in the ecosystem. Um, and, and that's uh, something that I uh, summarize here on this slide, where we, we see as our, our goal um, to achieve the vision that CO2 capture and use 
is recognized and implemented as a mainstream climate solution. When we started four years ago, um, this was a real vision and uh, very few people would listen to it, even though it was launched at the World Economic Forum's uh, annual meeting in Davos. Um, but in the last, especially year and a half, uh, things have just accelerated. I mean, this community is a testimony to how much interest uh, is, is currently in, in this field of capturing CO2 and putting it to good use. So the Global CO2 Initiative wants to uh, promote this and we see ourselves at the interface of innovation portals, businesses and governance bodies. And we contribute to all of them uh, through various um, activities that you see summarized here in this, in this uh, um, triangle. But I, I'd like to uh, expand a bit on that for just a moment by showing a snapshot uh, from our website. So the links are active, of course, on the website, not here, but it, it, it shows how we organize our work into three main pillars, uh, evaluation, uh, which is uh, part of the topic today. Um, we, of course, conduct research, not only in technology development, but also in social sciences uh, fields and uh, in economics. And then lastly, of course, uh, education uh, is, is a key uh, effort of ours. Um, if, if we think there is business and new economy in CO2 use, we need a workforce, right? We need new brilliant minds and experts uh, who actually can build and run this new economy. So we have lots of courses, we have innovative activities, uh, teaming student teams with uh, startup companies, and uh, in fact, one of our undergraduate students recently approached us with a desire to launch a student club. So that's currently in the works. But again, today's focus is on evaluation and there specifically on techno-economic assessment and life cycle assessment. And here is why this is so critical. When we started four years ago, we presented a roadmap that shows that there could be a trillion dollar market for CO2 based products created within back then about 15 years. Um, that's quite uh, a mouthful. Many of you have seen that roadmap and have downloaded it. If not, um, you will find a link here in the slides that will be shared. But while the vision was certainly uh, stated and a path to that uh, trillion dollar market uh, laid out, it was also apparent at that time that people didn't really know how to pick and choose. How should I choose my research field? How should I make investment decisions? There were no consistent transparent technology assessments. And therefore, um, there was a lot of confusion created by numbers floating around space and results from assessments contradicting uh, each other um, consistently. And that is certainly uh, detrimental, especially to an emerging field. So we took on that challenge and in 2018, published a guidelines document uh, that describes how such assessment should be done consistently and transparently. And this has been since uh, used widely. We've disseminated it through many different avenues and have convened meetings, have collected community input, practitioner input. And together with the uh, original um, authors of the uh, first guidelines document in Sheffield, Potsdam, Berlin, and Aachen, we're about to launch a new version of this uh, guidelines document. It furthermore has uh, um, created something really exciting, and that is a global interest in the willingness for further harmonization of such uh, assessment guidelines. So we're now working with uh, a large collection of US national laboratories and some uh, international national entities um, to further harmonize um, how assessments should be done to produce consistent results for everyone to, uh, to easily compare. So I invite this community and of course everyone else you'd like to share with um, to join us for uh, such events. But before going there, let me also make sure that these assessment reports are 
full of details. This is not a yes, you should do this or no, you should not do this and here is why. These are technical details that require a lot of time and knowledge to uh, understand. We have therefore reacted to community requests and produced a report, we call it making sense of uh, these assessments to guide decision makers so that uh, information is prepared accordingly and uh, um, also studies are being commissioned in a way that, uh, that is, um, is uh, accessible to researchers then. So what I'm saying with this and uh, this concluding slide is that we really provide the service to the community by listening to the community needs, feedback and working um, in collaboration. This document has been uh, the uh, result of about 300 individual inputs um, from workshops and, and uh, conference calls. So keep that flow of information going. I'm showing um, links to uh, attend this uh, webinar where we launch new guidelines, more information about us, and um, furthermore, uh, and perhaps Grant will speak about that, how to get engaged with us through a dedicated Slack channel. So with that, I hope that I've given you some sense of um, what we try to achieve and how, and I'll stop sharing here. Thank you, Volker. Um, and so, so yeah, as we mentioned before, and, and to anyone who just showed up, the links to that should be in the chat. Um, although I know when sometimes new people come into the Zoom call, sometimes they can't see the chat, so maybe we'll uh, repost those links. But yeah, we highly recommend you download these things and you download uh, these guidelines and they're our links on the Globe CO2 Initiative website to this repository of all of the different documents that we publish, um, and those are all free to download. And so we highly recommend to kind of have those in your toolbox so when you go to do a life cycle assessment or a techno-economic assessment of your own, or you go to critique one of someone else's, you'll have the, the ability to, to like reference these guidelines. And a very significant amount of work from a lot of scholars has gone into these. Um, and so, Volker, you talked about in the slides the importance of having the standard uh, assessments and, and having this like standardized model for how to go about these for LCA and TEA. Um, can you talk about why, like, like what's the importance of integrating these two? Like why is it LCA and TEA and, and not something else? And why isn't it, you know, why isn't it LCA and TEA separately? So like what's the importance of integrating uh, the economic and environmental assessment for, for carbon removal uh, technologies? Right, I, I think that's really a, a foundational question, Grant. Um, if, we, if we want to look at these two assessments separately and, um, and then seek um, maximum positive environmental impact and independently want to maximize uh, the economic uh, benefit, in other words, profit uh, of a technology, those might not be achievable with the same boundary conditions, with the same approach. And, 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 and therefore, um, I, I think we can run into uh, really difficult outcomes if somebody looks at this from a purely business point of view and ignores that particular decisions to maximize um, the, uh, the, um, um, the profit will actually create an environmental um, detriment uh, that in cases could actually lead to, the, if we talk about CO2, more CO2 being released than if we didn't even uh, include CO2 utilization in the process. So in, in a way, uh, you, you need to look at this as a, as a balance, right? Where, where not one goes up and one goes down, we, we try to maximize the positive impact of both, but in, 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 uh, in short, um, it's rarely possible to find the absolute maximum for environment and economics. We have to strike a balance. And therefore, you have to integrate these two assessments so that the boundary conditions are the same and output from one feeds into the other and vice versa. It's essential that we achieve that at some point. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, a lot of people who get involved in carbon tech research and entrepreneurship, you know, we're trying to make a buck. We're also trying to uh, help the climate. So, so yeah, so yeah, it's sure. natural that we want to do both of these. Um, and also just before I forget a quick note, if anyone has any questions, uh, please post those in the chat and then we'll have a Q and A section at the end uh, where, where we can get into those. But my next question should be relevant to a lot of people on the call. 
Uh, how should carbon tech researchers and entrepreneurs approach conducting LCAs and TEAs of their own technologies? And uh, related to this, when should they try to do one themselves um, versus trying to find someone else, whether it's a consultant or maybe a, a professor who's, or a postdoc or something who's a partner with, with their business? Uh, when should they approach them to, to do one? So how should you know, right. people on this call think about doing these assessments? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a question of uh, available expertise, but also resources. I mean, the, the startups that I've worked with uh, personally are, are typically constrained in so many ways. Uh, and, and adding one more thing to do to a, a, an already long list is oftentimes just not possible. Um, but I think it's, it's still important that everyone starts by looking at uh, key questions to ask. And I think that's where our guidelines document can be a good starting point, right? To sort of identify what are the critical uh, touch points for my technology? Where is uh, uh, an environmental opportunity or risk um, that I should have assessed? And then go from there. Um, I, I think uh, a higher level, um, simple, assessment is uh, certainly not too difficult. Once you get into the nitty gritty details, um, as you very well know, Grant, from your work with us, one can spend months in doing such a, an assessment. Um, uh, getting the data, et cetera, is, is sometimes a real challenge. But on the other hand, um, let's, not, let's not make that sound, oh my God, what uh, do I have to get into? Um, if we look at the techno-economic assessment, I mean, to a large extent, uh, related work is already being done essentially with every startup. You, you need to be able to make a business case. You need to be able to show how eventually you make a profit. So from that point of view, I think uh, there's a good starting point with that because that informs uh, about a number of questions that will, as we just talked about, also feed into the life cycle assessment. Okay, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And yeah, we've talked about this before about how the TEA needs to be done regardless. It needs to be done to inform cost models right. and, and the financial models for the business to help them uh, get funding and uh, you know, life cycle costing, looking at the cost over a product over its uh, use and, and end of right. life is important for justifying to customers why they should buy your products too. And, and that's kind of part of the TEA. But this question for me is bring up, uh, could you talk a little bit about the outputs of an LCA and then how a startup might use those outputs for more than say, just knowing that their product is good for the, for the, for the uh, climate? Well, of course, if you can demonstrate that your technology is uh, better in, in its environmental footprint, let's focus on CO2 for the moment, um, then a competing uh, product um, that puts uh, this, this uh, company in an, in, in an advantage. Um, of course, uh, as, we, as we can all guess, um, these CO2-based products at present are mostly more expensive than uh, traditionally made equivalent or similar products. So how do you, how do you come out ahead, even in, in early in, in, in that game? Um, you have to have a compelling argument, this is why I am better and the CO2 footprint is one such argument. Of course, um, we, we should not forget that um, a, a full life cycle assessment looks at other factors as well. Uh, what kind of materials are being used uh, in, in, in the total process? Are there any toxicity issues? Uh, are there any, any land use issues? I mean, many more such things. So it, it really builds a solid technical foundation that is quantifiable. Uh, to build a, a, a strong business case as well. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And one of the things that's coming to mind too, or um, at least from maybe what I've seen a few times, is thinking about trade-offs too. Maybe a new technology yeah. is better for the climate, but it's worse for land use, or it's worse in terms of ecotoxicity. And, and then you have to manage that trade-off. And you know, maybe Christoph will talk about this later. But and sure. what we try to do, we we want to manage that. So we want to identify where those trade-offs might be and figure out if we can factor in something uh, to the technical process from the beginning to try to control for that. So if you say ecotoxicity is a concern with some new carbon capture and utilization technology, can we build something into the process to contain 
whatever po pollutant might be getting out in the environment and, and causing that, that ecotoxicity. Mm -hmm. and, but we wouldn't know that without the, the LCA. So um, right. I and to... if, I, if I could add, Grant, um, yeah. I think it, it, building up on what you just said, I think it allows you to do a scenario analysis. Right? Because even if your current assessment points out that um, this makes no sense because the energy use is so high, your electricity comes from a coal-fired power plant, so do not do this. But this LCA will point you to what happens to my overall output outcome if the electricity is all carbon-free. Right? So it's, 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 it's a really powerful tool to let you play with what needs to come true for this to work? And does not always have to be um, a, a, or shouldn't be a, a status assessment, uh, but always look into the future. Right, it's not just about outputs, but it helps us ask new questions to guide right. new, new developments for, for exactly. the business. Um, so if I can move on to a different question. Um, what resources, databases, and services uh, would help accelerate the process of doing uh, these assessments for emerging CCUS technologies? So here what I'm thinking about is, you know, we've talked about how data acquisition can be a problem, um, right. especially for very new technologies, new processes, et cetera, or trying to find costs. I know it's something I struggle with, is trying to find costs of uh, unique capital equipment and that kind of stuff. It's tough. Um, right. So right. you talk about you know, what kinds of services and databases would help, do help, and maybe what are some things that the initiative is working on, uh, on this, in this front? Sure, there are, there are a, a number of databases uh, with, with well-characterized uh, uh, data. For example, uh, Argonne National Labs Grid Model, um, the National Energy Technology Laboratory um, is sort of a, a source for uh, DOE's guidance on, uh, on uh, uh, many of the funding opportunities, and they have lots of data to share. Um, there are uh, data from NIST, NIST, the National uh, Institute for Science and Technology, and so forth. I think that the, the crux of the problem here is that um, the earlier we go in technology readiness, the less we know about the actual energy consumption, etc. cetera. Um, so, so I think in all of these assessments, we need to be uh, mindful of conducting some sort of sensitivity analysis I think that sounds a little better than error analysis. And typically, nobody likes error analysis. Let's call it sensitivity analysis, which it is. Um, so we understand what are the most sensitive parameters to go. Um, but still, you know, it's, it's, it's a place where information is being scattered literally all over the world. And the fact that we now have uh, the World Wide Web at our fingertips for pretty much every aspect of our daily lives um, makes it somewhat easier, but not less challenging. So we actually are in the process of um, uh, designing and setting up a central space where people can come and get links to such resources, um, including additional tools and how to conduct these, uh, these assessments. So stay tuned. Uh, we will have this available in the next six months, I would think. Well, that sounds uh, very useful, even for our internal work too. And uh, it also this this reminds me too that I believe in within the guidelines there are some links to different sources for Indeed. different types of data too. So for things like labor costs, for example, I'm pretty sure there are links to maybe the Bureau of Labor Statistics or something, right. uh, which is which is a common source. So now, uh, um, if oh, if I ahead. could just briefly add, I mean yes, and and you know even even in the case where data is not available. Um, let's not be afraid to make a bold guess. Right? Let's make a bold guess and justify it and be upfront about it. Right? Because I mean, you know, if, if nothing else, it's reasonable and we've been proven right. If it's wrong, somebody will identify it as wrong and correct it and then we can, we can move on. But I, I think it would be a mistake to just throw up our hands and say, well, let's not do it because we're missing that critical piece of information. There's, there's, there's always a reason, uh, an opportunity in engineering and sciences to estimate within um, uh, acceptable limits uh, so we can move on. Yeah, and often.
often, like you say, you know, we have no other choice. So sometimes you know, we just need to make those informed guesses and, and just make it clear and then hope that maybe in the future we can find that data or improve on it. Um, mm -hmm. So now I want to move to Christoph and ask him some questions. So I'll give him an introduction. So Dr. Christoph Mangin is the program manager for business development uh, at the initiative. And he came to the University of Michigan after working for many years as a director of research and development in the automotive sector. Uh, Christoph's PhD is from MIT in material science and engineering economics. <clears throat> and he has a, a very deep experience in performing uh, evaluations of expected costs and complex and, and early stage uh, engineering projects. And so I work d directly with and, and under Christoph uh, doing the LCA and TEA work here on, on various uh, engineering projects uh, at, at the university related to uh, CCUS. So let's see, I came up with a list of questions to try to see if I can uh, give him a true test of his, his abilities and his experience. So first, Christoph, can you give the audience an overview of what conducting an integrated LCA and TEA actually looks like? Um, and so maybe just run through what what we do, you know, how, how do we approach this when a new project comes in the pipeline, kind of what, what is our main process for learning about the tech and then doing the evaluation and then talking with the researchers? Of course, Grant, I think um, what is very important to understand is this is not like creating a price tag or a value tag for a particular technology. Um, because most of the technologists are in the process of developing uh, the different elements, um, there is a lot of technical risk that they are going after. And also they, there's a lot of unknown. So the idea behind doing LCA and T assessment is actually more about creating a dynamic model that translates the technical ability that you know, that we all know uh, at that point in time and create a model um, usually based on a standard uh, Excel spreadsheet. So it's not, uh, you know, it's not a huge programming um, of the processes that are happening either for the life cycle analysis from uh, cradle to grave or, or understanding the life cycle costing, which is usually dominated, but not always by the production of that particular uh, component that we're doing. So at the very first part of all of this is to have a good technical understanding about what we are trying to accomplish as, as the technology comes along. Um, interviewing the technologists, which in most cases concentrate on the technical feasibility of, of their technology and the challenge, which is, is huge but also to grab all the information that we know or could know about what is certain and then make sure that the model is flexible on things that we don't know anything about at this point or is flexible for different scenarios or where the technology can go in the future. The main objective is to actually understand what are the sweet spots that will allow to have a, an environmental impact advantage along with an economic advantage. In most cases, and the, um, the environmental impact is justified. If it's not justified, there is really no point to go forward. Um, or we actually highlight that there is an issue just on the environmental impact as an output of an LCA. But when we combine the cost analysis um, of this particular uh, process or pathway, we now realize that often the environmental impact is okay, but the cost is really, really different from an expensive compared to the existing product. Uh, Professor Volker mentioned that, Sick presented that uh, a little bit earlier. So the whole advantage is to highlight to either the technologist and or the decision maker for a business decision and investment decision, what is really the likelihood that we could get into a sweet spot? And that guides very much uh, the technologist um, to actually find a way to have both environmental, environmental impact, positive environmental impact, and also cost efficiency. 
um, it creates uh, a clear, or at least as clear as we can get at that point in time, what is a technical risk, what is the economic, and what is the environmental impact, and show what is the challenge at stake in this three dimension. And I think often it, it highlights that there is some misconception about what the technology can do, and also bring everybody back into the reality of being successful at creating a pathway that would be helpful for not only the technologists, but also to the investment community that provide the funding for that technology to grow. Very, very interesting. Um, and so based on what you said about su surprises, I actually want to skip to a uh, question I had. Do you have any stories of a technology failing in a later development stage because there was not enough emphasis on LCA and TEA validation early on? So yeah, as you mentioned, there's these I, um, items and, you know, so, so what, what happened? Right. I, I don't like the world failing. Um, I think that um, in most cases, um, there is an opportunity to improve. Uh, and it was never, in a sense of if the technology was not achieving what they were supposed to achieve, uh, I guess you can call that failing. But in most cases, it's a realization that the technology was not suited to the original thought process or implementation uh, for the product. Um, that it was often rerouted and into something that would be of a benefit. Now, further, we are doing that later in the stage. Instead of building the model uh, early on, very early on, and then following step by step the development of the technology, eliminate the, the amount of waste of money, resources allocated to the project in general, and achieve to a faster delivery of the outcome. Um, I, I can give you uh, an example that always struck me uh, as uh, in, the, in the earlier career where uh, we were, uh, the team, the technologists were looking at super plasticity of aluminum alloy uh, to draw uh, some very deep drawing, some, um, some sheets that are uh, you know, forming them in such a fashion we could achieve design uh, uh, challenge that was happening in the automotive business. And after doing some of those life cycle analysis and economic assessment, everybody um, prior to that analysis were focusing on the, on the cycle time to actually do that parts because the competing uh, you know, technology was stamping steel. And, and they all wanted to reduce cycle time. So they were working on the equipment, working, the entire community was working on that to find out after the fact that the, just the cost of actually the aluminum, super plastic aluminum alloy were the bottleneck. So it was not that we were supposed to be working on cycle time first, which was an issue. So it was really at reducing the cost of the raw material and therefore doing research into alloy development. In order to do all of those things out of an analysis, you, you, you need to have a pretty good understanding of the technology and the science behind uh, all, all of those activities. That allow you to highlight and create insights about what are the options so that you help the technologist or you help the investing community to actually focus on what they need to do. Right, you need to know what's what's feasible. You know, there might be thermodynamic limitations or something of the right. sort that prevent altering a certain variable. But you want to know if that variables, if the output is sensitive to that variable, if it's even possible to vary it. And this whole conversation reminds me of that curve, which which many on the call may have seen, where it shows how it's it's there's this trade off where it gets much easier to assess a technology as it as it develops, but then your ability to change it to mm -hmm. modify it uh, goes down. And I've seen varying statistics on this that like 80% of the environmental impacts of a product are locked in during the first 20% of its development phase and things of that nature. So it's super important to do this, I think, at least from my experience and what you're talking about as early as possible. So you can get an idea of what's important, what are the hot spots, where can we focus to really have a high impact on making this product cheaper and making it 
just more environmentally friendly and, and more environmentally beneficial in the case of carbon removal. Um, so I want to ask you the same question that I asked Volker before, which is how should carbon tech researchers and entrepreneurs, so the people on this call, approach conducting the LCAs and TAs of their own technologies and when should they do it themselves versus finding someone else and, and kind of outsourcing this? So I wanted to get your views on this too, because I just think that this is probably a question that's, that's pretty relevant to a lot of people who signed up for this event. You know, they're interested in conducting their own right. LCATA. How should they, you know, what should they do if, if when this call ends and they want to do it, what, what should they do? Right. Well, I think that um, th there's a couple of challenges. Um, there is a tendency for folks to have a very precise uh, and a very deep uh, analysis um, of the, the environmental impact and the economic impact. M most of what uh, we are trying to do at the Global CO2 Initiative is to develop a set of tools that would allow to do a quicker delivery of those analysis because business decision making is not happening six months from now. It's often next week or the following month to do it, to be able to do something and design something. So there is a, a trade-off to do uh, between uh, the level of details and uh, basically the relevance of, of that, those results in phase of the, uh, of the, of the thing. So I'm gonna be very much answering similarly with what um, Professor Sick was mentioning earlier, I believe, which is that we need to develop an understanding about what to ask. The guidelines are very helpful at the minimum to be able to understand what the question to be asked if somebody is doing the work for you. If you want to do the work yourself, it will require that you have a very good understanding on, um, on what is uh, uh, already done on this particular technology evaluation. It is not rocket science. It's something that everybody on the call can do. They all have to be aware of the level at which they are doing it and therefore the risk associated with the decision they may make with the insight that they have. So I would strongly recommend to read the guidelines and deep dive if that is what they want to do, but also to get, if they do it themselves, to get a second um, neutral party to kind of verify their work and start working with it. As a function of time, we will all become a better experts at, at what's going on the same way that people are turning, to, you know, um, term sheets uh, for evaluating product when you're in the VCs or, or things of that nature, it is going to be part of the second nature um, uh, to, to actually be able to do that as a function of time. But it requires to deep dive and, and the, the devil is in the details. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so I just have one last question before we move on to audience Q&A. So as we've talked about, TEAs are useful for informing cost models and the financial models. Um, but based on your corporate experience, how do established companies think about using LCAs? Uh, are they considered during things like research and corporate development activities, like acquisitions of, of startups? And, um, and, and for investors, you know, do, do investors traditionally care about, say, LCAs of, of some kind of new product that's being developed by the, by the company? I think that uh, the, the more recent um, problem or concern with climate change um, has made people aware uh, more and more that uh, it is really important to do environmental impact evaluation. Um, it is required now for, for instance, for any proposal for the Department of Energy to have some level of assessment that all of that kind it's starting to become very important in the corporate strategy area of large company uh, on uh, what's required and what is, what is the impact of any project that is being uh, required. Um, so I think um, I'm not so sure that's true on every um, level of, of the companies that we can talk to. And it is expensive, um, but it is going to become um, a competitive advantage to be able to do those kind of activities 
um, and demonstrate that at least an evaluation has been made so that it justifies why we are working on this. The, the companies or the researchers um, or the, the, yeah, the, the business entities that, that are able to crack the nut where they are able to find uh, CO2 reduction impact technology that have economic advantage versus the, comp the competitive technology are going to be the winner of the future. There is no doubt about it. So learning how to do that today is, is really uh, something uh, doing it today and learning how to do it and learning what question to ask is going to be extremely important for the future. Definitely. And, and one other thing, too, just to add on before we move on to the audience Q&A, I know that the 45Q legislation actually has language in it specifying that you need an analysis of life cycle greenhouse gas emissions in order to be able to claim that credit. So, you know, hopefully we have more kinds of credits like these encouraging these like pro environment behaviors, but then to be able to claim them to be able if those uh, subsidies or credits or whatever are tied to the amount of CO2 being reduced or utilized or sequestered or whatever it might be, you might actually need the LCA to prove to the EPA or whoever it is that you've actually made that reduction that you're expected to make it and that you're allowed to take that amount of, uh, of, the, of the credit. Uh, so there could be that regulatory component. So I want to move on to the audience Q&A. So first, Volker, Christoph, thank you very much for answering all of my questions. It was a great <laughs> conversation. Uh, so I'm going to move to questions from the chat now, starting from top to bottom, and uh, both of you can feel free to, to answer. So the first question from Nicole, what are the key components of standardizing TEA when it seems like each business has its own unique business model, such so when each company is generating profit in its own kinds of different ways, different mechanisms, uh, and just has a different different model, you know, is it really even possible to standardize the, the TEA? Volker, you want me to answer that, I guess? Yes, please. Okay. Um, we have to keep in mind that we are not in a competition with the accounting department of a large corporation. The objective here is to compare technology to one another. And the approach that we are taking is to, to make a relationship between the technical processes and, and parameters that are um, of a fully accounted cost. Um, and being able to therefore standardize the way we are comparing technologies for a decision-making process. After that, the companies have many ways to optimize their profits um, or increase their revenues um, that may have nothing to do with actually uh, the cost of a particular technology. So it is it is really important that you stay um, always true to uh, that standard. And, um, and I've applied this approach um, in, in the industry where I was part of uh, to actually make portfolio project, you know, technology uh, portfolio assessment uh, in order to guide uh, what needs to be done and what decision needs to be happening for the sponsoring of certain technology development. So I think it is possible to standardize, but it will not be something that necessarily the chief financial officer of the company would actually be able to base a business plan on, but it would allow to compare technology to another in a systematic way. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And just from a very high operational level too, to contribute to this question, I mean, all businesses involve these activities that generate value. And so they all have these inputs and then there's some kind of process and there's some kind of output. And the TA is meant to, to try to capture those. So the inputs can be things like raw materials, energy and labor, which are required for uh, most businesses. Um, and then the activities can all involve things like cycle times. You know, it takes time to do these different processes to actually create some, some sort of value. And they have some sort of outputs, which, which we can try to uh, subscribe cost to. So yeah, I definitely agree that seems possible to, to standardize most things, especially from the cost side. Uh, so the next question from Alexandra, when you're performing the LCA on CO2 capture technology, are you also looking at the carbon embedded in the materials used to construct the technology beyond the environmental benefit of carbon removal? So your overall impact is then a balance of these carbon markers and the operational energy involved. So, so yeah, this is basically asking about mm -hmm. em embodied 
CO2 and, and is that part of the, the LCA? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a critical question. And, and I think they brings us back to where I started this, this conversation uh, earlier this, this afternoon. Um, we need to define the, the goal of, uh, of a study and, uh, and clearly articulate what question we want to answer. And if the, the question is the absolute environmental footprint, yes, of course, we will want to have that included. We will need to include the entire life cycle of, of a product. Um, but that is not always uh, the, the, the right question or the necessary question. Um, for example, if we were to look at um, making concrete with CO2 curing, um, we would still be following the entire processing um, um, uh, infrastructure of uh, regular concrete material, but we would have to add uh, everything that is needed to capture CO2 and deliver it. So that, there, there is some element of that. Um, we have other examples where we look at, let's say, a fuel or a chemical where we just would look at the production and the differences between traditional um, synthesis and CO2-based synthesis. So really, it's very critical to uh, articulate what question do I answer? Do I overall want to minimize the CO2 footprint of our economy? Ideally, that's what we want to do. But sometimes we have to take one step at a time. So very often, we just look at the technology. Yeah, and I will note, too, that sometimes with capital equipment, the embodied emissions can be negligible if that equipment is processing a very large, it is expected to process a very large amount of material throughout its life, um, because then when that, uh, then when the embodied emissions from that machine get distributed over millions and millions and millions of units, they may be negligible, but it's still important to, to check and, and have an idea of that, because for some equipment, it might not. It, it exactly. might actually be the case that, that it's a lot. You, you have to think about it. And exactly. So I mean, ne next, next week, I'll be using uh, an example of, a, of an LCA of dishwashing, right? Dishwashing machines versus hand washing, right? And even though it turns out that factoring in the cost of, of the hand towel and washing that is negligible, we don't know that up front. So at least some, some, uh, some uh, look into it might be useful at times. Definitely. And, you know, this kind of ties into to Marcus's uh, question next. I don't know if it's possible on short notice, and we only have about six minutes left, uh, so this may be mm -hmm. the last thing. Um, uh, but would it, be, it would be nice to go through a brief example of a concrete LCA on this call. So, Marcus, I don't know if you're asking for an LCA of, like, concrete, or if you're asking for a concrete, you know, like a good example of an LCA. <laughs> I, I guess we can do both, and, you know, I can take this question too. So when thinking about it, what you would want to do is classify all of the different stages of its of this life cycle. So if, say you're doing a precast element, so some sort of precast uh, pipe that holds utility stuff on, uh, underground on, under the street, you would want to think about, so generally the LCAs are comparative uh, or else it just turns into like a, an accounting uh, measure, an accounting thing. But so say you're comparing just a conventional concrete precast element or you're to something that say uh, it was made at the, or like it was made with this cement that captured the CO2 and the concrete itself sequesters uh, CO2 inside of it. And so if you're comparing those two, you would want to look at all of the life cycle phases. So that would be assessing energy use, emissions, and other environmental impacts from the raw materials that go into each pipe and, and then the, the shipping of those to the factory where the actual precast element is made. Um, so the shipping will involve some emissions based on the distance and the type of uh, transportation used. And then at the factory, you'll want to outline all of the steps of that process from the delivery and the batching of those ingredients to the mixing, to the curing, the drying, all, all that kind of stuff um, to storing on the yard. And then you'd want to look at the impacts from shipping it from that factory to the site where it's being used then you would want to look at the use phase, assuming this is the cradle to grave kind of analysis where you're looking at all of the, like every single life cycle stage, which is often important for what we do because we're very concerned with end of life emissions. You know, when the product decomposes, is it re releasing this captured CO2 back into the atmosphere? That's really important for uh, carbon removal technologies because uh, CO2, you know, remains in the atmosphere for thousands of years. We need to make sure it's sequestered for, for a good enough amount of time. Um, but, but regardless, so you'd want to look at the use phase of so things like maintenance and repair and what's the energy that goes into, say, digging that pipe back up and, you know, 
maybe the CCUS pipe is is more resilient. Maybe it doesn't break down as quickly. Uh, it needs fewer replacements, and so that would have relevant impacts you would want to look into. Um, and then finally, it's end of life. So when you go to break it apart or recycle it or whatever, um, are there differences between the conventional pipe and, and the CCUS one? Um, and sometimes there is no difference. And if there is no difference, then it's not as relevant to the analysis. So you really want to identify between the conventional standard market product and this new product, you know, what are the primary differences between those? And uh, that, that's how you can kind of identify where, where some of these benefits are. Um, so I, hope that's I, have a question, I have a question for you, Grant, since you've been asking questions <laughs> to everybody. Okay. Um, I, could, you, could you tell me how long it took you to do the last study with us? So that people have a sense about, is it, have you been doing that for a year or, uh, or, I mean, how fast can you do a turnaround? You know, Christoph, I was going to ask you this question, but I got distracted <laughs> and I didn't do it. So, um, so what I did in this last run, we, we were working on natural fibers here, um, seeing if we can use these natural fibers as a replacement uh, for, for the conventional fibers in automotive manufacturing. And uh, that doing the different, uh, so I did three technical cost models looking at the cost side for that. Um, and that took about... I would say one month, maybe, or no, I'll put it in terms of hours. Maybe it took about 80 hours to do three different models. Or so is that, does that yeah, sound right? I think, I'm trying I think to that, that is true. And I think that's extremely important where we are really trying at the Global CO2 Initiative to create a, a practical way for developing a has accurate or has precise or has detailed uh, cost model for and life cycle analysis in less than a month. Um, we're trying to go and stretch it to two weeks, but that's basically the kind of time that I think all of us needs to have. So if we are doing study for a year, um, the decision and the train has leave the station. So from, from that point of view, um, trying to get a, a modeling set that will combine LCA and TEA into one model with the same input with insight in two, in two weeks. That's really what we are trying to do in order to make it relevant for the business community, in my opinion. Certainly, and after you do it a few times, it gets a lot faster. Once you have a template down, once you can copy it over and you know how you wanna do most things, you know where to look uh, for this information, is good. So I see there's other questions, but I know we want to wrap up to make a few other announcements. So we can maybe share our contact information and also on the Slack group, um, in the Airminer Slack group, we can uh, share further resources and, and answer these questions. I'll put a prompt out, out today. And then any other uh, links to we, we can send along separately or, or on the Airminer Slack too. So with that, thank you again. Uh, Booker and Christoph, it's been a good discussion. And thank you, everybody, for listening. And I will turn it back to Jason to wrap things up. Thank you. Thanks, thank you for having us. Thank you, Grant. Thank you, Volker. And thank you, Christoph. Much, much, much appreciated. So uh, with that in mind, a few things. So yay. Uh, a few items to talk through first. Uh, we have a overabundance of questions coming in from the chat. So what we're gonna do is compile those and forward those along to Volker, Christoph, and Grant so that we honor the questions that we uh, did not have enough time to uh, get to today. Uh, we've got all sorts of other um, air miners activities coming up, but more importantly, building on the LCA and TEA uh, momentum, I wanted to cede the floor briefly to Francis Wang from Climate Works with an announcement about an RFP. So, Francis, um, you have the stage. Yeah, thanks, Jason, and thanks to the air miners and especially to the Global CO2 Initiative for uh, creating and sharing these important knowledge products to advance the field. Um, so, as Jason said, I'm part of the CDR team at Climate Works, and we're putting out a uh, request for proposals to better understand the techno the techno economic aspects of direct air capture to fuel. Um, 
it also hopes to integrate into transport demand models to really understand the role of DAC fuel in, in, in its potential to decarbonize long haul aviation. And we want to encourage the CDR community to work closely with other modeling communities like transport. Um, and we look for experts in TA and aviation demand modeling to collaborate on this project. So I will post the link to the RFP in the chat and uh, in the after event survey as well. And uh, you can check it out for how to apply. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you so much, Francis. Much appreciated. So a couple other items. For one, um, be sure to answer not just the post-event survey, but, for, but also to uh, answer the larger community engagement survey. You know, this Air Miners is a fantastic uh, you know, group, and we'd love to hear about how we can engage with each other for events like this and how we can help knit those connections together to uh, create a more, a, a more vibrant carbon removal community. Uh, again, LCA and TEA being a critical part of that. Um, so again, uh, if you haven't already, the uh, link went out earlier for the larger community engagement survey, uh, but also look to uh, a post-event email for that will include the links to the survey, to Francis's RFP, and, um, and, and also to additional notes from uh, from our show. And uh, the this will be recorded, or this is being recorded, so the Air Miners YouTube channel will have a link to this shortly. So um, for those who want to look through the incredible insights that we've gotten from our event today. Um, for future, a note we are going to have a Climate Week event featuring uh, additional luminaries uh, from, uh, from Air Miners talking through some of their triumphs, their challenges, and how uh, they have uh, persevered in the light of uh, some uh, very interesting developments and triumph and, uh, and, uh, and, and succeeded. So uh, that will be taking place on Wednesday the 23rd. I'll again be looking for an email for that. Uh, finally, uh, since we're near the top of the hour, uh, we are going to do what we typically do, which is uh, conclude and stop recording, but leave the Zoom line open for those of us who wish to remain and network amongst ourselves. We'll be doing uh, our Zoom breakout rooms of three or four individuals so that we can not just know of each other, but to get to know who we are, who one another is. So with that in mind, once again, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Volker. Thank you, Christoph. Thank you, Grant, for a highly engaging discussion. And thank you, Tito, for helping make this all happen as well. So with that, have a great day. And we were gonna stop recording now. So feel free to hang around if you wish.